All right. I, I think we'll get started with session three. Welcome to the third session of the day, anti-Semitism and Holocaust commemoration. I'm Stephanie Carrazza filling in as chair for this session. And we have three presentations, so I um, will get right to them. First up, we'll hear from Sean Rems from Concordia University with a paper titled The Hungarian Martyrs Synagogue and Its Sisterhood, a Locus of Holocaust Commemoration Avant la Lettre. Next will be Jason Chalmers, also from Concordia University, speaking about decolonizing the Montreal Holocaust Museum. And finally, we'll hear from Megan Hollinger from the University of Ottawa with a paper titled Combating Antisemitism in Contemporary Canada, Lessons Learned and Future Directions. I will um, read each speaker bio now and then we'll, get, we'll begin. Uh, so Sean Rems is a Masters of Judaica, Judaic Studies student in Concordia's Department of Religions and Cultures, who seeks to figure out the modes of community building and cultural transmission in the Hungarian Jewish community in Montreal from 1948 to the early 1980s uh, for his final project. For his PhD, he hopes he plans to extend this timeline as far back and forward as possible. Jason Chalmers is a Shirk postdoctoral fellow at Concordia University, where he is hosted by the Department of History and the School of Community and Public Affairs. His research explores how genocide commemoration interacts with settler colonialism, with a particular focus on museums, monuments, and other sites of public memory. His work has appeared in such journals as American Indian Quarterly, Socialist Studies, and Canadian Jewish Studies. Megan Hollinger is a PhD student in Religious Studies at the University of Ottawa. Her master's research examined legal responses to antisemitism in contemporary Canada. Her doctoral research explores social community-based strategies for combating antisemitism that engage both Jewish and non-Jewish communities across Canada. Megan is currently the membership chair and treasurer for the ACJS. Um, you each have 20 minutes to um, present and I'll notify you. I think I'll notify you when you have two minutes left. I'll try to gently uh, pop in and give you a, a reminder that there are two minutes left. And uh, we should have lots of time for questions at the end. So I will pass things over to Sean Rems now. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, many thanks to the organizers. Um, dear audience, Yavarachecha, Istanaud, Mega Bensulet Nepek, Eshajido. I hereby acknowledge that Concordia University is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Ganyang Kehaga. Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters from which we present and gather today. Jotjage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future, and our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. I would also like to take this opportunity to note the late Paul Herzeg's involvement in research on residential schools and to encourage the audience and their peers to explore the work of Professor David Kaufman, which is focused on Jewish indigenous encounters in North America, and makes due mention of luminaries such as Nakuset Shapiro, Erwin Kotler, and Judy Feld Carr in No Better Home. Also see George Reinitz's memoir, Re Wrestling with Life, page 84, which complements Paul Herzog's interview narrative on page 105 of the Montreal Schettel. I thank Janice Rosen and Ellen Vallet for their help in the Alex Dworkin archives, the University of Ottawa professor who is also working on early commemorations of the Holocaust, who facilitated the work of Janice and I by asking for Mira Giberovich's interview with Abba Beer to be digitized this past semester. I'm just gonna do screen share now, so you can all see a picture of the uh, um, Hungarian Martyr Synagogue. Uh, sorry, one moment. Can everyone see? Uh, can everyone see the, uh... very good, okay. The Hungarian Martyrs Beth Az Azikaron Synagogue, popularly known as the Schirmacher Shul, which may have been the only official or incorporated Hungarian speaking synagogue in North America, and probably the only to commemorate the Holocaust in its Hungarian context, can shed light on the agency of Holocaust survivors in view of different waves of post-war migration and a relationship to patterns of commemoration in the broader Montreal Jewish community. In this paper, I shall argue that the Holocaust commemorations of this congregation were notable for happening as early as they did, 
and unique in that Holocaust survivors themselves were front and center in the organizing and unfolding of these communal events. I will also make comparisons with three Tarantonian synagogues, put this in broader context of Canadian Jewish studies. In Montreal, as well as in other major Canadian cities such as Toronto, Vancouver, and Winnipeg, the default public or community-wide Holocaust memorials prior to the late 1970s or, or whereabouts were the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising commemorations. An archived communique of the Canadian Jewish Congress from 1963 indicates that the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising should not be characterized as an attempt to redeem Jewish honor contra Hannah Arendt's essentialized understanding of the Holocaust, but rather uh, to emphasize the banding together of diverse factions to physically resist. This document speaks against a prevailing assumption of Jewish passivity, as many absorb the news of the 1961 Eichmann trial through the lens of Arendt's reporting. As noted by Abba Beer in his interview with Mir Giberovich, survivors themselves were not at the forefront of these commemorations. They were appeals for resistance, but did not constitute a form for testimony. Holocaust survivor organizations were involved, but not in a subjective vein. Participants such as the esteemed Rabbi Pinhas Hirschbrook and poet Jacob Gladstein from their respective positions of Ahavat Israel in construing genocidal despair and a hopeful glimmer of resistance as Kiddush Hashem, and a modernism that would categorize the uprising as a generalizable archetype in the quest for liberty, speak to an array of discourses of martyrdom that valorized physical resistance. Around this time, the annual commemoration specific to the Hungarian Martyrs Congregation began. To contextualize, I should emphasize that while linguistic barriers were a primary motivation for the subgroup the Montreal Jewish community to have their own liturgical niche, other factors were in play as well. Zelda Abramson of the Montreal Shtetl interviewed a Holocaust survivor from the town of Nogkalo, who was turned down for Yom Kippur services in 1948 by the same synagogue, which later in 1963 hosted a large commemoration for the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Munkach born Peter Kleinman, also speaking on behalf of his fellow survivors, Arthur Schwartz and Simon Weiss, had a similar experience on Yom Kippur 1949, relaying that a synagogue official told them, every, uh, quote, everybody standing in the back without seats, please leave the synagogue, unquote. Kleiman saw this as a venomous indifference, given their unfathomable loneliness. In his May 1983 article commemorating the 25th anniversary of the Schnurmacher Synagogue, Wesley Goldstein writes, quote, that first year, 1957 for many, at high holiday time, most were unaware of the need to purchase seats, and consequently could not participate in services, unquote. This has been observed on a wider scale by Adara Goldberg, and she notes that survivors arriving in the 1948 to 1952 wave were more likely to suffer from this particular form of discrimination than those who came post-1956. Given the growth of Landsmannschaften, and a good example of this would be the Budapest Home Association in Montreal, which, which is linked to the Hungarian Martyrs uh, Synagogue uh, pretty shortly thereafter. Before the Holocaust became a feature of the North American and particularly Mont Montreal mental landscape, it seemed that there, were, there was considerable concern about the Holocaust and about Holocaust survivors, but not engaging with them on their own terms. For Hungarians, the linguistic isolation of quite a few compounded this distance. Abramson projects this reality through Miriam, wife of the survivor from Nagkalo, and Tom Perlmutter, who addresses the layers of marginality in which Hungarian Holocaust survivors of Montreal lived especially because they do not fit into the quote unquote three solitudes of English, French, and Yiddish. In chapter six of her book, Adara Goldberg argues that Toronto's Habonim and Kehal Machzike Hadas Clanton Park congregations were both important means for Holocaust survivors constituting faith and traditions, which logically correlate with practices of commemoration. The Hungarian Martyrs Congregation bears comparison with these two synagogues. The Habonim Synagogue could be categorized as close to the Hungarian neolog or comparatively traditional Central European reform on the denominational spectrum. And Clanton Park is trans-denominational in its survivor membership, meaning traditional. The Hungarian Martyr Synagogue was formally categorized as Orthodox, but served a congregation that was majority secular, a trend that is more common in Montreal than elsewhere in North America. As per its 1983 memorial book, it tended to portray the intergenerational legacy of Judaism in moral and universal terms reflecting Budapest-born Rabbi Schnurmacher's renowned sermons, which constituted a shift from what might be called the customs-oriented traditionalism of provincial and borderland Hungarian Jewry. This complexity of the religious spectrum is illustrated by the synagogue's historian, 
Dr. Chandor Domani, who addresses the relativity of denominational identification. For example, of the luminary congregation president and Bat Ha'ir participant, Lajos Bogler, regarding whom it is said, quote, in the area of religion, he represents ideas and concepts of the Hungarian Orthodox, then parentheses conservative congregation, spreading these ideas successfully in our congregation, unquote. This pertains to 1958-1959, when the gap between the Orthodox and conservative movements in North America was significantly less than today, and the qualifier of conservative speaks to a sustained accommodation with modernity, not only sermons in Hungarian, but also Umash and Sidur translations, Magyaru, as in Hungarian, and also perhaps a nod to the validity of neolog as a category of identification, that is to say, a recognition of the end of the denominational split of Hungarian Jewry that uh, lasted for several decades. Wilbur gives a sense that this old world liberality of discourse was operative particularly at the Hapunin. At Clanton Park, Wilbur emphasizes that the survivors' engagement with traditional Judaism was a golden thread connecting them with their murdered ancestors and destroyed communities, irrespective of generally not formally identifying with orthodoxy. This golden thread was the essence of many Montreal Hungarian survivors' patronage of the synagogue, which explicitly invoked the dead in its very name. In Kata Bohush's Hotel California, Hungarian Jewish refugee experiences in Toronto after the 1956 revolution, also presented at the 2012 ACGS conference, she mentions a congregation set up by Rabbi Zagun that was high holiday specific, did not convene in its own building, and was dependent on the rabbi to keep them together. This contrast with Montreal's Hungarian Martyrs Congregation for each criterion. The vast existential gap of understanding between Holocaust survivors and the previously established Canadian Jewish communities played out similarly in Montreal and Toronto. In Montreal, Judy Weissenberg Cohen observed the incommensurateness of the responses of the, the, the Gellers, the previous generation, towards the, the, the Greeners, the, the Holocaust survivor refugees, stating things like, quote, we had a tough time too. The butter was rationed during the war years, unquote. Judith Rubinstein, a co-founder of Clanton Park, observed similar insensitive remarks in Toronto. These misunderstandings were both on the micro level and macro level, as Weissenberg Cohen has observed that the Cold War and the incorporation of West Germany into the capitalist world made for a geopolitical context that also, that very often looked askance at the heroics of Holocaust survivors uh, in the partisans and elsewhere. Um, but this may, cha may have changed a bit with the uh, migration of the 1956 Hungarian refugees, and then all the more so with the Eichmann trial in 1961. And Abba Beer noted an opening up of discourse with the arrival of the 56ers and their great contribution to intellectual life in Montreal. Accounting for different denominational expectations of women's public involvement, it seems that the Hungarian Martyr Synagogue and their sisterhood more publicly involved in activities not inherently construed as feminine. The extant evidence shows that the women of the, sister, of the Hungarian sisterhood were very much crucial in these commemorative events, from the logistics to the public outreach aspects. Contrast of women's involvement based on the story of Ruth Lentz and Habonim could be corroborated upon discovery of whether women of the Hungarian sisterhood were allowed to attend meetings of the men's group from its inception. The sisterhoods of all three synagogues were very active in their congregations and beyond. The funds raised by Clanton Park in charity teas, fashion shows, and casino-esque game nights were crucial for the building of a social hall in 1956 and the sanctuary thereafter in 1960. Montreal's Hungarian sisterhood was legendary. With its representatives of a large cohort of the Hungarian Jewish community, its efficient collaboration with a men's section, and links to the wider philanthropy of the Montreal Jewish community as a whole, i.e. the Allied Jewish Community Services, which would soon become Federation CJA, boosting its successes for the congregation and, and beyond, um, particularly in the latter part of the 60s and then uh, in, in the 70s and thereafter. The sisterhood became more representative and successful thanks to its merger with the Hungarian-speaking Jewish Association in 1968 under the auspices of Erzsébet Feyes. The sisterhood drew from a large set of volunteers and sought to expand participation among synagogue members in the spirit of democracy and community involvement. Um, they were very successful in doing this and popular enthusiasm was high. I'm just, I'm gonna do a screen share of, um, the synagogue notable I'm about to talk about. Uh, 
Um, can everyone see the picture? Uh, the uh, the newspaper cutout. Okay, very good. Okay, um, Irene Romer was a uh, uh, she's third on the on the, on the left uh, next to her husband and uh, uh, and and, and Ms. Hochman on the on the right. Uh, oh, sorry, she's third on the right. Sorry, uh, Ms. Romer. Okay, so she was a renowned president from 1972 to 1978. His volunteer work spanned far beyond those six years. Sorry for interrupting. I, I see just the uh, the synagogue. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. yeah me too. Okay. Um, I, I have to change how I'm on. Oh, there we go. I'm in, okay. okay. I wasn't able to make the changes. Yeah. Okay. So she's she's third on the uh, Irene Romer is, is third on the. Uh, um, uh, on, on the right. Um, okay, so with her being at the helm of a group of philanthropic women, she greatly invigorated Federation CJA, and this speaks to the data that Hungarian Jews donated the most of any ethnic subgroup per capita to the CJA campaigns of the early 1980s. And I should just share. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll share uh, the remaining photos at the end. Um, yeah, she also played an important role in the Holocaust commemorative event starting in the 1960s, extending to 2012. Romer decided during a presidency that all relevant events, including the Holocaust commemorations, would be held at synagogues in order to help restore a sense of traditional Jewish identification. Thomas Hecht, whose Holocaust refugee story has been chronicled by Goldberg in her book, played a significant role liaising between the martyr synagogue, sisterhood, and the Federation, and was very much in the interdenominational spirit that would characterize Holocaust commemorations after the founding of the Montreal Holocaust Memorial Center in September of 1979. In his interview with Mira Giberovich, Abba Beer seems to suggest that there may have been a causal link between Ferenc Hardy's the leadership of the East District Executive of the Jewish Congress in that era, his presidency started in 1977, and the consolidation of Holocaust commemoration for a Montreal-wide Yom HaShoah. Hardy, along with Beer and fellow survivor activists such as Lou Zablo, Tibor Weinberger, Sarah Kleinplatz, Issy Weisfeld, Rose Zucker, and allies such as Stephen Cummings, were thus part of the transformation of Holocaust memory onto a scale where it was more effectively mutable and portable for communal, communal solidarity and education. Beer also noted a kind of slowing down of the earlier non-Hungarian Holocaust commemorating organizations, the Association of Survivors of Nazi Oppression. At that point in the interview, Giberovich articulates, quote, except for the women's auxiliary, the women's division, unquote. Beer concurs that it was communally active, but not really in Holocaust commemoration as such. The Hungarian Sisterhood, by contrast, was very much involved with its congregation's Holocaust commemoration. Evidence from one of my interviews suggests that only much later, once the Hungarian Martyrs Congregation merged with the Heber Kedisha Bene Jacob, did this group of Hungarian women shift away from dealing with Holocaust commemorations to focus on less emotive cultural activities for which they, also, uh, they had decades uh, of experience organizing. Meanwhile, the Hungarian Martyrs Congregation continued with its characteristic style of commemoration, which is focused on the uniqueness of the Hungarian chapter of the Holocaust, the betrayal of patriotic Jewish communities by envious co-nationals, and featured particular aesthetic forms, such as Holocaust-themed uh, liturgically resonant poetry that tugged at many heartstrings. Barnai Jenny's poems, recited by Irene Romer at commemorations such as the 1977 one entitled Prayer, often feature rich pastoral detail that conceivably could have brought to mind the landscapes of the Hungarian hometown um, of the survivors. I think I could do a screen share. Wait. Uh, okay. uh, sorry. No forest beast was ever hunted so. No herds were ever so driven on the range. I learned history a long time ago. No tyrant was ever such a tyrant before. This passage, uh, given that it speaks to uh, the unprecedented nature of the Holocaust and the shock of the viciousness of their co-nationals under irredentist Hungarian rule, and most of all, 1944-45, could be read as a retort to the overused generalization cheap to the slaughter that was decontextualized from Abba Kovner's testimonies. Now, I think I... One. Poem 600,000 by Erna Laszlo, uh, a reference to the estimate of the number of victims of the Holocaust in Greater Hungary, speaks volumes about the diversity of Jewish life in these lands and their shared genocidal oppression. I excerpted here. 
Your mother is there and so is mine. Life is behind them. They march and march. Servants or masters belittled or praised. Did they measure dry goods or write in fever? Did she come home and kiss the doorpost? Did she till the soil or bring up an orphan? Did she labor or squander her day? These stanzas speak to the tremendous variety of occupations, class positionalities, degrees of religious observance, and attitudes towards the charms of some Hungarian urban centers among Jewish women in Hungary. The appertaining memorial explicitly speaks to this unity and diversity. Quote, Every Hungarian Jewish brother and sister is cordially invited, unquote, as, as the ad went. The last stanza has a distinct resonance of Psalm 137. Compare the following with the injunction, not to forget Jerusalem as part of the Birkat Hamazon blessing after meals. Jew, forget them if you can, but first tear out your heart with your own hands, unquote. This clarion call to memory is in keeping with the sentiments of many survivors, such as Peter Kleinman, who gives an account of his Holocaust memory vis-a-vis -a, -vis a phenomenology of time and the fallacy of race in the Shoah. While there is nostalgia in terms of the private sphere and identification with Hungarian language, culture, and literature, remembering Hungarian ethnic identification and the social contract with the Hungarian state revealed far different sentiments. Dr. Barna, Yogi Hegedush, Ferenc Hardy, and Rabbi Schnurmacher attested this in a speech at the inauguration of the synagogue's own building on June 6, 1971, and in the memorial volumes forward. They emphasized how assimilation and its discursive corollaries led to a purely negative sense of Jewishness, i.e. being defined by antisemitism, which they sought to turn around by instilling in their congregations a sense of majestic morality within the Jewish traditions. Acculturation to the new host country of Canada, separated from the old social contract and old world antisemitism, is construed by a key cohort of leaders as a victory worth savoring. At the 1963 Purim Ball, Dr. Shandar Damani, uh, writes, my eyes saw again the glittering ballroom filled with happy, smiling and dancing young people. And I was overwhelmed with the sense of their joy uh, as he also saw in these youths a wonderful future for, for the Jewish people. And then quote, I thanked fate and my new country, Canada, which made this marvelous feeling possible, it gave us a chance to live in human dignity without discrimination, unquote. And a significant number of my interviews, survivors and their children did see Canada as a golden Medina, which invites reflection on the recent No Better Home anthology, especially uh, Mia Shfiro's chapter. The other point of memory of this vast destruction was how it's been interwoven into communal priorities in light of contemporaneous politics and envisioning the future. The retroactive rejection of the social contract with the Hungarian state was associated in a formal status belief in Jewish self-determination, i.e. Zionism. The synagogue leadership was explicit that the Yom Azikaron ceremonies were for both the martyrs of the Holocaust and Israeli war dead, pointing to an alignment of the imperative of communal memory to the counterposition between the diasporic reality ripe for betrayal and the existential importance of Jewish statehood. To paraphrase key notables, Hungarian Jews had finally caught up with Herzl. In keeping with Harold Troper's set of arguments in the defining decade, which addressed a coterminous upsurge in the Holocaust commemoration as well, there was an efflorescence of charitable events to support Israel in the aftermath of the 1967 and 1973 wars. It must be noted that the Hungarian Martyrs Congregation's adjunct organizations provided uh, support for Israel before that time, as well as for a plethora of other causes, especially for Jews still living in Kadarist Hungary. Thank you all for listening. And uh, if there's time, I, uh, I, I think I should screen, screen share um, the, uh, some of the pictures I intended to share earlier. So this is uh, uh, Irene Romer uh, on the far right, uh, next to her husband and, and uh, Rabbi Schnurmacher at the podium at the Bima. And then for the 2012 um, commemoration event. This is at the, the Heber Kedisha B'nai Yaakov, which uh, the, uh, the Hungarian Martyrs Synagogue merged with in 2002. And also the, uh, the poem that came before 600,000, uh, uh, The Great Miracle by Laszlo Brody. Um, yeah, and that concludes my presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sean. Megan, I see that you're here, but your video and mute is not on.
Can you come on screen to do your presentation, please? Megan was one of those people who, uh, until very recently, uh, was powerless uh, as a consequence of the storm. So I wonder if there has been a glitch somewhere along the way. Megan, if you would like to interrupt me, please do so. But if not, we will have to sort of proceed around. Hi, Hernan. Sorry, I, I'm i still finishing. I missed that. That's okay. It's your turn. Oh, already. Okay, one sec. One second. She'll be with us in a second. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Sorry, Hernan. I thought I was going at four. <laughs> and it ended up being earlier than I thought. Oh, because you're doing questions at the end. Right. Okay. Indeed. I'm so sorry about that. I'm all ready to go. All right. Just have to put the power, but I hope you weren't waiting too long. No, no. Okay. Here you are. I had the computer over there, but I couldn't. Okay. Stephanie is chairing the, the session. She has already introduced you, I believe, if memory serves me correct. So uh, you're free to go, I think. Okay, here perfect. On. Sorry again. <laughs> so we're on the first slide. All right. So this presentation is not a paper per se. This is my doctoral project that's in the works. Um, so I call the project, same problem alternative approaches, combating anti-Semitism in contemporary Canada. And so what I want today is to present the proposed research plan. And I wanted, I thought this would be a good venue to get feedback, questions and conversation uh, for this work in progress. So again, this is not like, I don't have data necessarily yet. I haven't done the field work or the data collection, just, um, working on um, getting a plan together, reaching out to different communities, and I'll explain that in the presentation. So if uh, anybody would like to provide feedback, that would be much appreciated. I don't know why it's not working. There we go. So basically what we do know in Canada is that anti-Semitism is on the rise. This is based on um i guess hate crime statistics collected by police and reported to statistics canada as well as um the data collected by benebrith canada's league for human rights and so what we know is the number of incidents have gone up and the amount of hate crimes as well in canada jews account for the most targeted or sorry they are the most targeted religious group for hate and oftentimes not every year but they're usually one of the most targeted groups in general, regardless of motivation for the hate, uh, according to the police reported that. So this in my master's brought me to um, the question of if this is going up and we keep turning to legislative and political or policy solutions, why does this keep going up? And this seemed to be in mainstream discourses, the go-to way to fix hate crimes. And so I wanted to analyze that further. And so this is research I have presented, so I won't go on about it too, too much. But just to summarize those findings, what I found were several shortcomings with legal responses through a discourse analysis of hate crime cases, uh, mostly about anti-Semitic hate crimes. There were some other forms of hate uh, seen in the evidence by those who were accused of the charges under the hate propaganda section of the criminal code. But what I found were the shortcomings that were um, mostly related to how the courts conceptualize both anti-Semitism and Jewish identity. And so the problem was that sometimes they would see Jew Jews, Jews as particularly a religious group or maybe as a racial group, as opposed to a group with a complex identity that can be represented in many ways and you know, religiously, ethnically, culturally, et cetera. And they didn't understand that anti-Semitism was something that um, 
was multifaceted as well, just like Jewish identity. And just like there are many ways Jews are targeted for being Jews, there are many, uh, sorry, many ways that Jews identify as Jews, there are many ways Jews can be targeted. And anti-Semitism often hits those, um, those different aspects of Jewish identity. So we have, you know, the religiously motivated hate that we saw more medieval times and maybe it's 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 waned in the its mainstream manifestations in today's world but it still exists and then we see also traditional racial hatred which we still see amongst white supremacists in neo-nazi circles but now we see a lot of it manifesting as um in certain types of expressions of anti-israelism or anti-zionism which again is its own complex they're their own complex phenomena but um they're not, the line as to what is anti-Semitic in that rhetoric and what is not is a bit blurred, so I won't get into that. But we do see anti-Semitism sometimes in that circle and coming also now from the uh, left side of the political spectrum and again from the right, the far right. And so it's pretty diverse and the courts seem to miss that. And how they conceptualize Jews seem to be related to how they conceptualize anti-Semitism. And so what I also realized was that the legislation and the parameters set out within it were not necessarily geared to prosecute legally um, or have someone convicted as guilty for spreading certain types of hate, such as anti-Semitism that might appear as anti-Zionism or anti-Israelism. And when people were harmed because of the rhetoric of, of like the latter, um, they, you know, people, this might normalize it more broadly because it can't necessarily be uh, prosecuted in the court. So there were a couple shortcomings that I thought, okay, law is an important tool, but it's not, let's shift focus to something else. And I thought in today's world in Canada, most of the, um, a lot of the anti-Semitism is coming from the bottom up. It's coming from people, it's coming from social circles, it, it's coming on campus, it's coming on, uh, it's coming from hugely, on, largely online, social media. And so I wanted to look at solutions that targeted that social aspect and that community aspect and thought, is there a way to look at what communities might be doing on the ground level, as ground level as between the interaction between two people even, or in, um, you know, a communal setting, such as in a synagogue, something where Jews are engaging with Jewish community, non-Jewish communities to build bridges, men divides, and create better social relations and better perceptions of each other. And so these are just some pictures of some different, um, I believe these are from B'nai B'rith's audit in, for 2020 or 2019. And these are just different pictures submitted of different anti-Semitic incidents in Canada. And so, as is this one, so my hypothesis for the project was that social community-based strategies would be better suited to combat anti-Semitism on a deeper level and on a wider scale than legal and political solutions. Not saying policy won't help or won't make a difference in some way, and it, it can be very important as well as legal tools, but I argue we need to shift focus to something that hits the root causes of anti-Semitism in Canada in a stronger way. So that was the hypothesis of the, of the project. And so my research and questions, the main ones include the following. So I want to ask what strategies are working in communities, which are not, and can these strategies reduce anti-Semitism? You know, one of the questions that comes up when you look at anti-Semitism and combating it is, what does combating it mean to different people? Does it mean reducing enacted hate? So what we see as incidents and hate crimes, is it reducing the attitudes? So the prejudices that, you know, someone might harbor but don't necessarily express or what they express doesn't get, you know, you know, people aren't charged criminally for it. Um, is it combating those? Is it um, trying to create better social relations? Like what does that mean? And how can we measure the efficacy of these strategies and initiatives or the, their effect, how effective they are? And I don't know if there's a scale for doing that. So that's one of the questions I hope to find and answers I hope to find through presenting the project proposal. Um, because one of the things I intend to do with the research is develop some sort of scale or criteria to determine efficacy of different strategies. Um, so again, the goals of the project are identifying which solutions have worked, 
to effectively combat anti-Semitism and foster more positive relations between Jews and non-Jews, to determine whether we these strategies can and should be broadened for wider reaching social and policy action, because policy helps to some degree. It can, you know, uh, strategies can be funded, publicized, promoted, et cetera, through policy. Um, and it also gives the Jewish community allies at higher levels. So there is an important aspect to policy, but again, I think that can be, mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. I, I think that that can be something that might help, but we need to uh, create a wider focus of an array of strategies. So it is also to develop a toolkit of diverse and nuanced strategies, um, which includes strengthening legal ones that exist to combat the different types of anti-Semitism, its motivations, its manifestations, um, and again, to develop a scheme or scale to measure the efficacy of these strategies and efforts. So this is where I also would like, if anybody has any feedback for this project, um, any ideas for maybe theoretical frameworks or methodological frameworks. So the two that I use that inspire my work are deep equality and lived religion. So I'm actually gonna start with the bottom one, lived religion. So lived religion is basically the idea in a nutshell that we have to understand how people live and express their religiosity every day. They're not gonna do it in the same way as someone else. And you know, if Jewish loss is one thing, well, how are Jews living their Jewishness in their daily lives? It might not look like what halacha set you know or or prescribed so i want to understand how people are experiencing anti-semitism and how every day they engage socially with those who are not jewish and navigate that world with peace with love with compassion and with a, the goal of equality which brings me to the next methodological theoretical framework deep equality so this is the work that's been done in depth by my supervisor dr laurie beeman and it's basically the idea that we can understand equality in a deep sense, not a shallow or superficial sense of equality, but when people really look at somebody who seems like the other as an equal and in, in every sense of the word. And that instances of deep equality theoretically exist at the most basic level. So like I said, interactions between two people, for example, and how people on the ground navigate living equally with each other peacefully and coexisting every single day. Um, these are events that are not necessarily focused on in some of the literature and in, in some of the research. And so she calls, Dr. Beeman calls these events non-events. So non-events are basically, um, again, everyday events that are kind of overlooked and are seen as just basic interactions or, or non-important, insignificant or insignificant interactions every day. So I want to look at those because I think that's where we're going to see what people on the ground are actually doing to foster better relations with each other. And so I'm going to do this work in three cities. So we have Ottawa, Victoria, BC, and Montreal. And they were all chosen for different reasons. And I don't know if I have enough time to go in depth about why I chose each one. Um, I think Montreal, uh, because of the unique context of Jews in Quebec, their unique history, and the nuances of their community, as well as the um, religious and political situation in Quebec that has evolved over time into the present day, has also created a unique context for Jews living in Quebec, as well as other minorities. And so it was an important location to consider, along with it being one of Canada's largest communities and at one time the largest Jewish community. It's very significant uh, size-wise. Victoria, um, historically Jews in Victoria and out West have had an easier time integrating and building community than elsewhere in Canada. And so one of the things I thought I should look at was why, is, why are things different out there? Historically, we have some explanations, but I wanna know um, because in B'nai B'rith's data sets, they tend to, um, I can't remember for this year, but they tend to post um, decreases every year in terms of reported incidents. Whereas in Quebec and Ontario, there are increases. And so things seem to be progressively worse here. I wanna know why out West, even though they experience anti-Semitism, why it seems, you know, what factors might influence it being lower. Oh, and then Ottawa. So I'm from Ottawa, this is my hometown and I've grown up in the Jewish community here. And I have to say it's 
some, it's fairly integrated as a community into Ottawa in general. Um, we don't have a lot of Jewish resources or institutions and we do have some, but Jews here rely on many non-Jewish institutions and services to in their daily lives. Uh, we also have one of the highest rates of uh, intermarriage in Canada, which doesn't necessarily in, um, indicate that there's less anti-Semitism. What it might indicate is that um, what it might indicate is that there's more mixing and relations between Jews and non-Jews, which is kind of what to me might hint that there's something going on maybe in Ottawa that allows Jews and non-Jews to collaborate to have relations in different ways with each other um, that maybe are not happening in other communities. So that's basically why Ottawa is on the map. It is the federal capital. Sorry, the national capital also has federal government here as well as um, different advocacy groups and other um, organizations that combat anti-Semitism every day. So it has that unique feature as well. And just for say one out of time, so again, this is where my field work will be, which will mostly consist of interviews and uh, site visits and participating in different strategies and programs in these communities. Um, and then the data will be analyzed with the discourse analysis, um, specifically, let's go to the last page. I always use um, the guiding ideas of Michel Foucault and his ideas of discourse to understand more broadly you know, I'm not wanna go so literal on the language, but I wanna stand the, understand themes that are going on in the interviews and in the interview data I get. What, you know, look at different themes, anti-Semitism, combating it, social relations, uh, themes such as those. And what are people saying? What are they not saying? Are there counter discourses and, uh, or alternative things people say in different contexts, in different conversations from different backgrounds? I wanna see what underlies the different strategies when people discuss them and maybe figure out what makes them effective, what might not make them effective, what do people think make them makes them effective. So this is where the discourse analysis using Foucault's ideas of discourse will help, Michel Foucault, as well as different psychological theories. So the one that I really want to test through my work or use as a guiding framework is contact theory. And so contact theory in a nutshell is the idea that there's potential for when people of different backgrounds um, interact with each other and it's positive interaction, it might reduce the prejudices they have towards one another and the respective communities they come from because of the positive contact that they share. And so that's something I wanna see if that's at play as well. So it's like the field of psychology offers several different studies um, on intergroup relations, and creating better social relations. And so I think they'll be helpful as well. Um, so I really just want to get feedback from everybody to see, you know, maybe some places that can look in the communities, um, different theoretical frameworks that might be helpful. Um, and just really, as I'm really in the stage of designing the fieldwork component, because that's where I am, uh, just to make it as strong as possible, because I think we really need to shift our focus to these kinds of strategies, initiatives and efforts in order to, you know, have a whole array of tools to combat anti-Semitism in different ways. So that's the end. So I'm gonna stop. Um, maybe I'll keep the screen share. Well, should I keep the screen share on? Um, you might bring it back up if someone has a question based okay. on something and they want you to call it back so up. I'm gonna pull it back down. Perfect. And again, I'm sorry about, We've had a couple things going on here. So I had the computer on, but I didn't quite hear you had finished with the other presentation. So no problem. And you stuck to your time very well. So I, Did I? I appreciate okay, that I didn't I, have to, I didn't have to interrupt. I don't know any of that. The <laughs> first time I did that. Um, well done. I just want to say before we open it up to questions that it's really nice to see um, young scholars, a panel of three young scholars, two in grad school, one I think quite recently out of grad school. Um, so it's really great to see your energy. Um, and I love hearing historical presentations based on my background. So I really enjoyed Sean, um, your presentation. And then it was so, it felt so useful to hear these other two really practical, useful um, reflections, guidance for us. So um, I thought it was a really great panel. Um, so now we will open it to questions, and I want to reiterate what 
um, Jesse said when he opened the question panel of the first session today, which is this is a chance to ask questions to these three young scholars about their research, um, not to make statements, um, but to uh, but to think about to help um, make, Megan asked for help and guidance with her project. So maybe to offer guidance directly related to the projects or ask questions directly related to the projects. Um, I'd like to go to David Kaufman um, to ask the first question, please. Thank you so much for your presentation. So, Megan, I have a question for you. And uh, so you find shortcomings in, you know, in, in yeah. legislating against hate, and instead you want to focus on online social stuff. Um, uh, and I, I think you highlighted sort of solidarity intercommunal work, uh, which I think is pretty interesting and a good, a good um, a good thing to do. I'd certainly be interested in seeing what successful uh, programs like that look like and what unsuccessful ones look like and why those are successful or successful. Mm -hmm. I also wondered if you might think a little bit more about policy, not, I mean, you spoke about policy as if it's like a, um, just a, a, a litigation issue about hate crime legis legislation, but there's policy that happens on lots of different levels of institutions. So I'm thinking about EDI, about inclusion, you know, equity, inclusion, diversity, training, um, you know, statements and training and the policies that institutions develop at universities, in unions, in school boards, um, all kinds of like mid-level policy. Um, and, you know, anti-Semitism, it you know fits in into this part of the conversation with equity differently from diversity and inclusion. They're all a little bit different. Um, so I'm just wondering if you sort of thought about analyzing like institutions that have this kind of doing, you know, integrating anti-Semitism work in the EDI stuff and the ones who are not, and seeing if you can yeah. so, discover outcomes. Thank you, David, so much for that. That is really important. Uh, and that's not something I gave a whole lot of thought to, which is why I want to present this and get everyone, you know, their expert opinions, because that's really helpful. Um, my thing with EDI that I have noticed is anti-Semitism, I don't know in every single organization, level of government, you know, private public sector, I don't know. It seems to be missing from a lot of the, you know, conversations on equity, diversity, and inclusion. It really does. And I think part of the problem is making anti-Semitism seem just as important and a priority as other forms of hate. And people don't understand the status of Jews as a minority because a lot of times we were quite integrated and we've made it to that point where we are not, um, there are very few barriers to us in the professional you know, arena. And Jews can do quite well. And you know, some do, some don't, some make it, you know, they can climb the financial ladder, others don't, but I think those tropes of Jews are all successful. Jews are just, you know, that exists. And I think it blocks a lot of people's abilities to see Jews as um, a minority that also suffers a significant amount of hate and are targeted um, and are not seen as equals. And so I think that that's really important, but unfortunately it's, it is missing from a lot of different organizations, EDI programs and frameworks. So that's just something that would be very interesting to look into further. So thank you. I'll happily talk with you after the conference about this because I've got yes. some thoughts about this. Uh, Richard Menkes, next, please. Thank you and thank you everybody. Can you hear me okay? Thank you everybody for your presentations. Um, just a couple of quick points. Um, um, one of them, uh, to Megan, just very briefly, I. I, I, when listening to you wanting to deal with the issue of anti-Semitism and how to categorize it, I wanted to recommend an older piece that was done by Ben Halpern many years ago, inspired by the uh, sociologists of the 1930s, where he did a mapping sentence of anti-Semitism, trying to take a look at its various forms and intensities. And um, I took a screenshot of his mapping sentence from his article, and I've sent it to you by email, and perhaps you'd find that of interest. Thank you very much, Richard. I appreciate that. I will definitely take a look. There are lots of questions. We'll go next to Natalia Veselova and then David Orenstein and then Hadassah and then David Kaufman again. So we've got, got lots of questions for you all. Great panel. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm off camera. Um, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Megan uh, a quick question. Uh, Megan, a quick question about your uh, data interpretation. 
Oh, uh, wouldn't it um, be safe to suggest, or would it be possible to suggest that a high rate of uh, intermarriages uh, implies a less religious community? Uh, what would you think about that? Thank you. That's a great question, Natalia. Thank you for that. Um, I think one, well, just from knowing Ottawa's community, um, like I had said earlier, it's quite integrated compared to other communities in Canada. I mean, there are other communities that are quite integrated and smaller as well, and also maybe have less Jewish institutions to rely upon than even Ottawa. But the one thing that I've noticed about Ottawa's communities, it's incredibly diverse in terms of people's um, religiosity and their level of observance with Judaism. Um, we have, you know, many Jews who are reform. We have a reconstructionist congregation. We have conservative congregations. We have orthodox congregations for people of, you know, of different orthodox background, you know, backgrounds. It, it, that makes sense. So it's a really religiously diverse community, but I think because it's smaller than, you know, Montreal, Toronto, I don't really know what the reasons for the higher intermarriage is here, but like I said, it's incredibly religiously diverse and dependent upon the broader Ottawa community. Um, you know, we do have Jewish family services. We have a federation. Um, we have a mikvah, you know, but we don't have the Jewish General Hospital. We don't, we have a, a nursing home, but we don't have, you know, extensive community organizations um, where we could be completely, where we're institutionally complete here. And so I think there's just a larger dependence and even historically, a lot of Jews here, um, you know, they opened, they went into the food industry, you know, with restaurants, they were in, you know, uh, merchants and vendors. And I think they relied upon doing business with the broader Ottawa community as well. And, you know, there are Jews here that came for government jobs, there's Jews here for different reasons. And I think there's just a lot of interaction with the general community. Um, and so I'm wondering if that plays a factor, but it's a very religiously diverse community. And definitely it's not one that's easy like Montreal has Hasidic communities we have Chabad but we don't have the same level of like our Jews aren't as traditional here I would say overall as other places in Canada though there are Orthodox Jews and like I said we have Chabad Jews um so it's quite all over the place here from my experience and from what I've read and learned than in other places in Canada especially in Montreal where it's so um generally speaking, insular and traditional. Um, so I'm wondering if that's a factor, but I don't know for sure, unfortunately. Well, great, thank you. Thank you. That um, so I think David Orenstein is next. Um. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is also for, for Megan. I very much enjoyed your presentation, especially the fact that what you're doing is asking questions about how to deal with anti-Semitism, totally tr Jewish traditional. Uh, so uh, my, my question comes from uh, my own experience. Uh, I'm a member of a small uh, independent uh, progressive synagogue, uh, more or less in downtown Toronto. And before the pandemic, we met in a local United Church. But during the pandemic, it, we moved into full partnership with the United Congregation, but also the local uh, Unitarian uh, Congregation. And that's officially the Danforth Multi-Faith uh, uh, Commons. So we haven't had too much opportunity to really work with the other groups because of the pandemic. Uh, we've just started to have our ma fully masked in-person in uh, 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 Shab Shabbat uh, services. So how, what might we look for there and what might we try in, in order to mutually support each other in dealing with the hatreds we want to combat? And I should also add that for quite a while, uh, both us and at least the United uh, Church, um, I just don't know about the uh, Unitarian, having part of a larger East End regional uh, multi-faith organization, which in, in addition to the various churches also includes uh, the local mosque. Again, what can you look for there and what might you try to do there? And of course, any equivalent uh, groups, because I know we aren't the only synagogue that shares space as well with the church. That's great questions. Thank you, David. Um, 
I haven't done the data collection yet, of course, so it's hard for me to know exactly what is out there, but one, you know, just preliminary talks with people. I mean, this is not officially collected field work, but I think what people find seem to find effective or what they tend to like to do are programs that actively engage, you know, two groups, you know, Jewish, non-Jewish, whoever the non-Jewish group may be, um, in looking for a common goal and working towards something, a common goal together. So maybe it's a, a charitable initiative, maybe it's an educational initiative or program. Um, it's when people come together and work together and actively do something, it seems to be where uh, might be something. I it could, it could even be a collaboration, like I said, but maybe it's not for a goal, maybe it's just collaborating to host a program, to learn more about each other's backgrounds, communities, et cetera. Um, that's a great question. And, and I would I would say ask me definitely again in, in, in a year from now when I hopefully have a lot more data <laughs> collected and yeah. And almost as we say at Passover, next year at York University. Next year at York University, absolutely. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Next question from Hadassah. Megan. Um, my head swirls around anti-Semitism. When you were talking, it was like, goodness, I don't know how it's all going to be solved. Um, so much is happening, so much every single day. Uh, when I think, um, I just wanted to put it out, this out to you, that what are your thoughts on comments that um, anti-Semitism is so pervasive that it's uh, to be invisible? and um, do you think that uh, too often we dehistorize Jewish people from their suffering? Um, so, okay, so, sorry, say the second part again. I just want to make do sure you, I got that. Do you think, because this anti-Semitism comes in, uh, uh, yeah. uh, that individuals at times uh, don't even correlate the facts um, about the Jewish history? So when they do the things they do and the slanderous and hateful things that they do, um, for example, I'm sure you know that the, the painting of swastikas and um, you know, derogatory comments, I'm not even going to name a few, but um, with that, do you think that uh, too often that people dehistorize Jewish people from all of that suffering? Absolutely, to that part. Um, to the first part about it being so pervasive and everything, yes, um, definitely ties into that, I think. But, you know, sometimes I sit here with my research and I kind of have that same thought of you as I don't know if this will ever get completely solved. And I don't want to do the research thinking that because you obviously want to eradicate it. But I think it's kind of like a lot of things you can't, it's just, it's there and it's so pervasive. I don't think you can. But I think what we see time and time again is the history of the Jewish people and the suffering they face. Um, is often minimized. It's, a, it's eliminated from different narratives and discourses. And here's the thing. I Sometimes I think even the successes of Jews throughout history are overlooked or distorted by anti-Semites in such a way that it looks like, you know, if we have success, well, we were corrupt. So that's how we achieved it. Or we're, you know, evil people. So it was at the detriment of somebody else to benefit ourselves. Like there's always a way the trope is worked in, whether it's a success mm -hmm. or it's denying the Jewish people their history and delegitimizing that. So yes, I do think that's one of the challenges as well as all these narratives that are out there um, run counter to what we know about Jewish history. And so that is definitely a challenge as well, I think. Yeah. Um, next. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you to all three presenters. I'm not going to ask a bunch of questions, um, but I just want, yeah, I just think that the, the the type of work that you are all doing is is excellent. So I applaud you for that. Um, Sean, you have been shortchanged on questions, so I'm going to, uh, I'm throwing a question your way. Um, I, I'm familiar with the Gibrovich uh, interviews that you refer to because I'm actually using them at present in my own research, um, and particularly the one with Ababir. Um, and I wonder if you can speak to, this is a methodol methodological question really, um, how reliable do you think those sorts of interviews are um, and how much stock can we obviously by extension put into those interviews that are conducted 
years, if not decades, after the period that the word uh, that is being discussed. Thank you for your question, uh, Professor Tesselmabe. I really appreciate it, and I and I really appreciate that that you uh, your, your your work in, in in the archives and that that specific uh, set of interviews. Um, I think that they're, they're still very very relevant. And what I think would be particularly interesting methodologically is comparing um, Avivir's interview with uh, Mir Gibervich with his interview with uh, Zelda Abramson 25 years later. And when, when you look at the interviews of Holocaust survivors uh, across many years, across decades, and, and you see how approaches evolve, what gets more or, or less emphasized and, and how it fits with the memory culture of the, the times, that, that's very interesting. So for example, in the, that has been emphasized, I think, by Henry Greenspan, uh, for example, in Professor High's uh, Beyond Testimony and Trauma Anthology. Um, and I think that just overall that the, it's an excellent interview and, and it covers a lot of ground and they, they really try to understand each other's perspectives. Um, they really try to, um, to deconstruct, to address the, the whole clinical biases that were foisted upon Holocaust survivors in, in, the, in the 50s to you know, all the way into the 80s. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and they, they talk about you know, the, the work of um, child survivors and second generation like uh, Helen Epstein, and Robert Krell, who's, who, and, and you know, their work is still you know, hugely relevant and they're coming out, they've been coming out with new work recently. Um, and I just think it's just important to, you know, look at the interview as a whole, in addition to, you know, mining it for, you know, specific data. So that, that was like the approach that I did when I was the, in, in the archives, um, uh, in, in the Alex Dworkin archives a, a few weeks ago, um, I, you know, was looking at the interview and then, then I, then I realized, oh, okay, I need to, to, have it like a digitized version to be able to, to look over it, you know, again, so that, that I look at the different contexts, I'm able to make, you know, certain comparisons and to see, you know, what, what, what has changed and, and, and what hasn't. So, um, yeah, and, and just the, those, those inferences uh, to make, like, should be understood in, in that larger context, like, and, and, and the fact that I'm trying to read it in, in juxtaposition with the memorial book for the, the Schnurmacher synagogue. Um, so I, I'm trying to look at, you know, certain simultaneities like so-and-so being on the executive and meanwhile, you know, there are these commemorations. So I'm just sometimes making inferences based on a sense of simultaneity and, uh, and just, just getting a sense from, from the primary sources of like who's, you know, what kind of participation is, is happening, like where's the most uh, where's the center of gravity in, in terms of commemoration? Um, and, and yeah, and and, and I, I should just emphasize, I'm so I'm so happy that you're that you're you're doing this research. Um, like what? Well, likewise, thank you, Sean, very yeah. much. Mm -hmm. Caitlin Hayes, you're next to ask a question. Yeah, this is for Megan. I was just wondering if she had thought of potentially comparing um, Asian American discrimination, given that they too also face this double bind of being oftentimes um, seen as a successful minority that's had a lot of entrepreneurial success and particularly with certain uh, industries like tech, they're seen as being very successful and therefore not really being a minority that faces discrimination in the wider populace's eyes. Um, but at the same time, this legacy kind of creates this double bind where they face extra scrutiny. Um, and so I wonder if this might be a good comparison point, this, this Asian hate that's been going on in the US and Canada that there's been extensive amounts of research on and comparing that to the modern phenomena of anti-Semitism, because so, these are, yep. Sorry, go ahead, finish your question. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, because these are in some ways very similar groups and they may also have interesting parallels if you were to interview both of them in the same areas. Yep, thank you, Kayla. No, yeah, that's a really interesting point. I didn't think about 
uh, the anti-Asian discrimination aspect. When I was originally building the project, I talked to my supervisor and said, would it be helpful to, um, sorry, the dog's part, would it be helpful to do, you know, to look at anti-Semitism and Islamophobia was the one that I had mentioned, try to do a, maybe more than one. She said, no, no, I think you just need to focus on anti-Semitism. So that's the mindset that I've taken mm -hmm. um, to keep it focused enough. Um, but it's a really interesting thing to look at comparatively because also out West, um, in, uh, you know, as the Jewish community was forming, there was a lot of anti-Asian racism and racism for the large Asian communities that were developing out West versus the Jewish community that was developing out West. Um, and there's obviously other reasons why this happened versus, so I think it's an interesting thing that could help me maybe drive which communities I look at, maybe look at how any collaboration that's been done between Asian communities and Jewish communities or maybe different strategies, initiatives, how the two have come together, programs, what have you. I think that that's an interesting direction. I don't know um, if I would do like a comparative approach on a larger scale as part of the like discourse analysis and the interview data, but I think, or like, you know, targeting the Asian community more than others in terms of examining them, but it's an interesting uh, direction to look at. And I didn't think about that. So I'm going to keep my eye open for any that initiatives and stuff that between the two communities that yeah might be helpful. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, my pleasure. I just see a lot of not only activism in terms of the social domain, but there's also yeah. been policy and there's been a lot of community well, building. So and you know even just briefly, just to not take up all the time on my mm -hmm. thing, um, you know even the pandemic inspired mm -hmm. so much hate against Jews and Asians. Like we saw yeah. that increase in anti-Asian racism and, and anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. So Definitely. that is a really interesting perspective and uh, corner to look at. So thank you for that. Yeah, for my that. pleasure. <laughs> Good luck. Thanks. Uh, with that, um, I think it's 431, so it's a sign of a really good panel that we went one minute over. Um, so thank you everyone for your great questions and thank you so much to the three presenters for an excellent panel. I think the next thing on the schedule is a break slash open schmooze session until five and then the next session is at five. <laughs>